Hello everybody, this is Black Coffee with Ice. It's your host with the most, Justin Penner here. And we got Jeremy. Just kidding. How's Hello. it going? <laughs> yeah. Hello. What I am you? so excited to be here. I'm excited to see, I was really excited. Like, he gives a different intro every time. How's he going to hit me uh, today? I, I missed a line in there. I was like thinking about it. I was like, you know, it's a little cringe. One day you'll get like a stride that's just the perfect intro. And then people will be mad when you don't give that intro. Yeah. You'll get sick of it. You'll go to a new intro. People will be like, what happened to the old one? <laughs> yeah. So how you doing? Me? I'm doing good, Yay. man. Doing good, yeah. Did a little bit of interview practice today. Ooh. Yeah. How do you how do you practice for an interview? Well, the MMI is a little different. Um, so it's essentially eleven stations. Okay. You have two minutes to read a prompt, whether that's a picture, like an abstract picture. Right. A quote, ethical dilemma, any kind of issue, and you have to read it, write some notes, and then you have to go and present it in front of a, a spe- like a speaker or somebody, or okay. somebody just like an interviewer or whatever. Yeah. So, so yeah, you just you got to like make a structure, look at all the perspectives, show what kind of person you are, or throw yeah. some, sprinkle some personal examples yeah. in. But yeah, it's it's tough, but I like it though, man. Yeah. And you should, cause you're pretty good at. It. Oh, wow. <laughs> making me blush. Well, I got to I got I to come in with the the whole idea that this is this is your thing cuz I was watching or I was listening to some of the podcasts last night just re-listening to some of the bits I'd missed and mm. and I was watching Coles and I thought, "Oh man, who the fuck am I?" <laughs> I know. He, he, right? he set the how bar. Do fo- how do you follow that guy up? Like, what a hero. I know. Like, how many miles did you run last yeah. year? And not even just a hero to like like a cause, but like to someone who has nothing to do with the cause, you start caring about things. You're like, what could I do? Mm-hmm. That would be awesome. <laughs> I know. He totally, insp- like, he inspires me just to, yeah. to be better. And the, the thing is that, that really blo- like blows my mind with that whole situation with Cole is just, like, he he should be way more well-known. Yeah. It's, it's, a, it's an insane story. He should be famous. Like, yeah, the fact that he came back to work at one point, I didn't even know all this had happened. I'm just like, hey, man, how you doing? Haven't seen you in a while. Yeah. You know, nothing about it. And then someone later goes, you know what he did, right? I was like, oh, shit. I know. It's it's insane. And, that's and you feel bad. There's no reason I should have or I could have known because no one told me. But, like, no, that, that, that should have been out there. That should have been obvious. I know. Especially here in Winnipeg. That should definitely be in the history books. Yeah. And, uh, you know what, I feel like just with, like, the way that, like, different perspectives are changing, like, in the whole – city uh, the city as a whole i guess the narrative is a little bit changing like for yeah. example like with respect to just like indigenous people mm-hmm. um now every class even if it's like an older elderly you know caucasian professor he's gonna say like we're on treaty whatever land we acknowledge that we stole this land yeah. and it's just the narrative seems to be changing a, a little bit and i feel because he did it roughly 10 years ago if he yeah. did it today with today's social media it would have been it would have been huge and yeah. that's why i had him on because i just wanted to because like spread that yeah, yeah so because people were like you at work were like this guy did something like yeah. i didn't know and then yeah it just blows your mind it absolutely blows your mind yeah yeah. So enough about Cole. Let's <laughs> right. talk about Jeremy. <laughs> yeah, sure. Let's talk about me. So, um, yeah. So just to give a little bit of context, uh, I work with Jeremy, and I knew he's an interesting character from day one because he like grew up in Dubai, and then after gr- growing up there, he wanted to pick the best place in the world to move to, <laughs> so he picked Winnipeg, Manitoba. Oh yeah, that was. That was how it went. <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> no, not no. quite that smooth. <laughs> no. Best place in the world to go to. You could go anywhere from here, Jeremy. Winnipeg. Winnipeg. Always. Win. No, yeah. I, I would love to. Uh, I would love to love the city more than I do, but uh, I, I do now. I'm starting to love it. I guess. Yeah, it's good. <laughs> it it's, is a really good city. It's like, especially compared to other places in Canada. Like we get sun here. You mm, know, snow. Yeah. Minus fifty two <laughs> last night. <laughs> Yeah, you know, Ugh, all the camel brutal. rides, you know. No, no but it, it's been a ride to get here, and uh, yeah, I'm happy to be here now. Yeah, so, I mean, how how did you end up here? I always wondered that. So, the ride started, I was born in London, Ontario, okay. and uh, spent about seven years there mm-hmm. as a kid. <laughs> didn't you, you could say I grew up there, but I didn't grow up at yeah. all. You're seven years old, you haven't grown up at all yet. I was just kind of like learning what the world was. Um, and then my dad got a job 
encouraged by other family members to become a teacher. He was working at a TV station at the time. And he got a teaching job in Brandon at ACC doing multimedia web design, uh, video, stuff like that. So he went out a couple weeks before us. It was like, we're moving. And I remember crying in the corner of my room or something, but that, like, that's all. Mm-hmm. I did, there wasn't much reason to stay except this is what I know. Uh, so we moved out to Brandon and I spent a long time actually growing up there, oh. making friends, learning who I was a little bit. And uh, I had turned 15. I was like partway through grade nine. And my sister comes up to me on the stairs and she goes, we're moving to Abu Dhabi. And I was like, oh, I didn't even care where it was. I'd never heard of this place in my life. I didn't know what the hell she was talking about, but I knew she was serious. And I didn't say why. I didn't ask any questions. I just said, no, we're not. We're not moving. Yeah, and I was like, like stewed for a little bit about it. And I was like, how do I tell my parents I'm not moving? Because I had just got my first girlfriend, like high school was oh. starting to gel. Things were happening. I was like, yes, life is maybe getting good now. Uh, and then, boom, we're gone across the world. Damn. Yeah. So I spent high school out there. And uh, when I turned 18, I had about 30 days, maybe 60, to leave the country. <laughs> oh, really? Yeah. They don't let you stay if you're an expatriate. Oh, really? Um yeah, you're basically on, I was on my school, my dad's work visa, part of that. Uh, and as long as I was going to school, it was fine. But as soon as I turned 18, became an independent or whatever, um, it was like, get out. Oh, wow. They don't want, we don't want you marrying our women. <laughs> we don't <laughs> yeah. want you uh, taking our, our small time jobs because you can't walk into a place in, in the UAE and get hired. You can't walk in with a resume yeah. and get hired. They do all their hiring through, you know, small circuits of mostly lower wage people because they know they won't, you know, that's why they came to the country and Uh, that's what they have. So you're really just stuck there until you're not. And then either you have a big job lined up that they asked you to do or you're gone. Oh, wow. And I wasn't part of any big school or anything. I didn't, didn't even graduate the first time in grade 12. So, Oh, really? (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Uh, But it was basically get out and I didn't know anyone anywhere. So I went back to Brandon. That's oh, the only wow. place I knew anyone. So I said, um, my girlfriend long distance at the time was like, hey, can I move in with you for a bit? And that was a shit show and a half. But oh, uh, yeah. just because don't do the long distance thing. If I could give any advice to young people, don't do not do it. Yeah. If you're still learning who you are and you haven't been in that many relationships yet, just save yourself the, the trouble. It is tough, man. Yeah. Especially with today's day and age. It's like, it's so hard to trust people just due to... Just like the, just how easy it is to do whatever you want with yeah. anybody. I mean, how easy it is to connect with people you don't even know. Like, you don't even know. Just yeah. send a little notification, and yeah. So it definitely would save you the heartache. But what's that other thing you always tell me? Don't move in with your significant other. <laughs> don't move in with your significant other until you know how you want to live, and usually that means living alone. Because mm-hmm. um, you're, you know, you live with parents up until whenever, and at some point you move out either because you're with someone and they offer that kind of thing. But I've seen enough people go straight to moving in with someone else from their parents that they didn't, there was too much pressure Mm -hmm. on the other person of like, I have, I have this with my parents and we do this and this, and this is the way. And it's like, you don't really know how you want to live until you're living alone. When you start to develop that routine of like, okay, this is the time I need myself. This is the time like I want to do my thing. And if someone else is there, there's either pressure to be with them at all times, you know, mm-hmm. to talk with them at all times, and you really do need your own space. So, yeah, no, that makes sense. Just wanted yeah. to let the other viewers know. Uh, but what was I going to say here? Oh yeah, so what was the biggest difference between high school and Brandon? Because you got a taste of that for yeah. grade nine, and the difference between that and a school in. Abu Dhabi, that's in Dubai, right? Uh, uh, no, Dubai is... I have is, no idea. <laughs> Abu Dhabi is the capital of the United Arab Emirates. Oh, okay. Dubai is another city in the United Arab Emirates. Oh. It's bigger. It's more well-known. It's worldwide kind of thing. But Abu Dhabi is the capital of that country. Oh, so, so it's still pretty big, though. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah, I think it was a population of a million, something oh, like wow. that. Not a lot bigger than... Size-wise, I would actually say it's probably smaller than Winnipeg. Um, but just way more, but people. just way denser, like, you know, high rises, the whole city, um, around, uh, but yeah, same country, different city. Uh, the biggest difference, 
high school would have been the cliqueiness didn't exist. Um, mm. People didn't, it wasn't a big enough school to like separate into your own kind of group. You had to be with everyone oh. all the time. And yes, like eventually when it, we'd, you'd pair off with the people you really like, your friends, you, you didn't have to hang out with everyone all the time, mm. but there was always interaction with the people. Like if you, you either played basketball or you sat around talking about music um, but they're very family oriented out there. And even though only 40% of the population is actually local, like it's mostly people from all over the world. Oh, wow. So I went to school with people from England, New Zealand, uh, Jordan, like a lot of places, a lot of Arabic countries, but from all over like Egypt. Oh, wow. There was only, I think two white Canadians in my high school class, <laughs> oh, me wow. and one other girl. Oh, wow. Yeah. So you've definitely felt that <laughs> melting pot. The melting pot is real. And it's so weird to talk about it now because everyone thinks it's this, there's this level of separation um, when you first go there. But you're just kids at the time. Like everyone's sort of the yeah. same and there's a little bit of a language barrier. But once you get through that, you just, you adopt it so quickly. I think you have to live in these places to really get that culture yeah. ingrained in you. The idea that like everyone's sort of the same and it's, yeah. it's fine. I know. I kind of got that too. Just go like a different scale, but just going to inner city elementary school. Yeah. Being around people of all different cultures in the West End. And e even today's day and age, like I just, I'm always around people of different cultures and i feel like we all are but we are just yeah and we don't get that their cultures are mostly the same like there's a few subtle differences things like when you greet someone there you shake their hand no matter what like and it's not a shake it's just like a you clasp hands like there's a connection you you mm -hmm. make a physical connection when you meet someone even if it's for the first time or the people i'd see every day like <laughs> i'd go back i'd see them be like hey what's up and you grab hands no matter what mm -hmm. um but here it's like germs. <laughs> here it's yeah, either like it's yeah, either bro. like germs or like oh you know I'm not a hugger kind of yeah. thing. But you don't hug people out there. You just you make a connection. And it didn't matter uh, so much. But yeah, it was less cliquey and a lot more, a lot more intimate. I guess you don't talk about nothing really. There's always and one thing I I learned to be outgoing there because. The shyness here is sort of like, I don't want to say celebrated, but uh, a lot of people, you'll see posts all the time about, hey, I am I like doing my own thing, and mm -hmm. sometimes I just need me time. And mm -hmm. yeah, that's true. Everyone can, you can get that. You can go off on your own whenever. But if you're with people, you're with people, and you are together. Oh, you're not doing just nothing? No. Oh, okay. And even if you are doing nothing, you're you're doing nothing very much together. Like we would go to shisha bars and just sit for four or five hours. Oh, wow. Smoking some <laughs> shisha and just talking. <laughs> and you were allowed to do that. It wasn't a culture of, hey, you know, are you buying anything? Then you should be somewhere else kind of thing. It was a very hangout all the time, be together. Locals, especially if they weren't with their family, they were talking to their family on the phone mm, yeah. all day, every day. And it was really annoying when you're trying to watch a movie. That's <laughs> one thing I don't miss about there is going to theater movies where people's cell phones are ringing off oh. the hook and there's no, there's, there's no usher you can talk to who's going to kick out a local worth millions of Durham because yeah. <laughs> <laughs> everyone's related to a shake. Everyone's related to a prince or something. Oh. Yeah. So you don't want to mess with that. Like they'll... They have free reign. They'll cut into lines. They don't give a shit. Oh. You can't really do anything. You're just like, well, fuck me, I guess. <laughs> yeah, I don't know anybody. <laughs> that's yeah. funny. Um, but that's sort of the way it is out there. Yeah, man. Uh, uh, when I was watching Creed 2, did you watch that movie? I wanted to. See, it's one of those movies that's on my list that I'm like, I have to see this. I yeah. have to see this. And usually you ask me if I've seen a movie, I've seen it, but not that one. Just wait till it's online. Okay. But, uh, oh, there was like these, like, a group of like 10 people that came and they were so loud the whole movie. <laughs> and so there was, so it was me and my friend uh, Jamal. Yeah. yeah. And we were sitting probably second row from the top. And then there was about three of those, the group of 10 that were behind us. Yeah. They were just chilling there and all their friends came and it was about 15 minutes into the movie. And you're like, okay, so you're thinking in your head, all right, so they're going to be quiet. They're going to, you know, be respectful yeah. and just sneak in and we can watch the movie. But no, <laughs> they're, yo, what's up, bro? And like, oh, just like, no. every, t everybody shook hands. Like, what's up, bro? What's yeah. up, bro? And like, they all shook hands. 
and we're just sitting there and it's just the movie's happening the movie's happening 15 minutes in and then like during very emotional parts and because you know a lot of people are actually invested in this that have been watching the rocky movies like they've been waiting for this movie and they're just like laughing when he gets punched out and stuff and i'm just like hey so i turned around because i'm usually that guy yeah i'm just like hey like someone's gotta be yeah just because everybody's looking back and i'm just like hey just can you just be a little bit quiet just you know we're all just trying to watch and then they just like look at me and then continue talking and then about 20 minutes go by of them talking and then i went back i was like can you please just be quiet just for everybody just trying to be just think about everybody else here yeah and that's why i will not go to movies on (laughs) tuesdays anymore at uh, silver city or what any day i think it's gonna be busy i'm like no Mm -hmm. and everyone goes oh you know netflix the theater's being around like good kill the theater too expensive who needs it (laughs) it's too expensive to run it's too expensive to go it's ridiculous. They make all their money off fucking popcorn because they can't even make money off the movies anymore. They they got to pay Joe Schmo and Jimmy Johnson and all those people, you know, <laughs> producer X. Yeah, it's stupid. And man, I went I went and got a large popcorn and a large, you know, a medium medium pop, large popcorn and candy. It was like yep. 25, 30 bucks or however much. Yeah, and, it's insane. Plus, and when, when else would you do that? You have to excuse it by like, I got to treat myself like I only go to a movie once a month or whatever it yeah. is. <laughs> but the theaters, it, maybe it is time for them to die. Like Netflix is, is picking it up and other services are available now. You can get anything you want anywhere. And yes, it's nice to like have that big experience when it comes to like a big old action movie or something, no. something where you want that spectacle. But, oh, there's so much bullshit around it. But, yeah, no, that actually kind of uh, just comes into play with this book that I was reading. I, I took a little break from it, but, like, from the first p- part that I was reading, it was just saying how the Co- Kodak company, like, the company, the camera company. Yeah. So their biggest mistake was when cameras were just becoming uh, mainstream, they, they invested not in the technology – even though some people in the biz are like invest in the technology because this is where it's going. Yeah. But they really honed the market on the um, development of the photos, the development of film. Mm. So they put all their resources into that, but they went bankrupt. Like now I think it's a different Kodak company or like yeah. resurge later on in life, but they went bankrupt because all the other companies were investing in the technology. And this is just what I'm saying about the movie theaters is that, eventually these things are going to be eventually the process of a of a market is that it's going to be eventually free and for everybody yeah so just like the development of film it's free you could take it on your phone now yeah and you don't and so that's what we have to look at with respect to like movie theaters it's gonna there's gonna be busy oh sorry it's gonna be expensive but then eventually like with our with all our technology, it's going to be free for everybody. Yeah, yeah. And they're going to have to find those like there's theaters that still show old movies, mm-hmm. and I, I think even Silver City and stuff will do that every now and again. Like, hey, here's an old classic that you might you never got to <laughs> yeah. see in the theater. That's a cool experience, and I feel like the people who would go to those things are not the talkers. You know, oh, those are the yeah. guys who will go to brand new movie because what do you do on a Friday night or whatever. And they're the ones chatting in the back. And I will be, I'll also be the guy to turn around and be like, just shut up. Yeah. I'm not as nice as you are. <laughs> no. I, I don't have patience for that. So I'm like trying to watch this. I'm like, guys, we're all watching. Shut up. Yeah. There's nothing I hate more than when somebody is talking during a movie. Yeah. Like I, oh yeah, it's so. And un- if you're going to be on your phone the whole time, just get in the back row. Because. Turn the brightness down. Yeah. There was a, a lady with her kid. Just They were both on their phone the entire time, and they chose the first three, those down rows, where everyone above them has to look at that screen. I walked all the way down there. I'm like, can you please just put your phone away? Everyone behind can see you. And it's like, why do I have to say these things? Yeah. Why are you in a movie? You, you're paying to do what you could be doing for free at home. Uh, but that's that's classic problem. That's whatever. Anyways, in Abu Dhabi, that's pretty bad. It, it's terrible for that. I went and saw the third <laughs> Lord of the Rings twice. Because the first time was opening night, and we're like, opening night! Packed theater and packed with cell phone ringers. and People, and people taking just calls. Yeah, talking, literally taking calls, like, just, and chatting, and 
I don't know if it's worse or better if it's in a different language. <laughs> like Arabic is a is a kind of a nice language to listen yeah. to, but not when you're trying to watch a no. movie. <laughs> not when you're trying to watch a movie. It is weird, man. Different different languages. It's just so yeah. It's just it sounds so fo- like f- foreign. Foreign. But it sounds so different. Yeah. And it's crazy how it's it's just something completely d- different that we don't understand. It's did you ever watch the uh, the YouTube video that that did? Um, how english sounds to foreigners oh no it's very interesting it's like a couple at home having a conversation and they're not they're speaking gibberish but in a very english way so that oh. as an english speaker you can listen to and go oh english would sound this like this if i couldn't oh. understand it oh I it's pretty cool it gives you a little bit of perspective and perspective is the most important thing <laughs> all right now we're into perspective. now we're into there perspective is the most important thing at least to me and that was that's just the way i was raised so we got a little off topic. Yeah, but, but we were talking good, though. Like, yeah. I, I think it was interesting. No, it was good stuff. Um, I'm fine with going. Like I said, I'm tangent man, so you just <laughs> rein me in whenever. Tell us some stories, man, because yeah. you have some crazy stories. This guy has been through everything, man. I've been through a lot of stuff. Um, yeah. And with, in regards to perspective, that's just I was raised by a lot of different people at a lot, like, around the same time. Um, I spent most of my childhood at a friend's house or with my grandparents on either side. And they were very, very different people. Um, So you get a lot of perspectives and and you learn very quickly how to relate to people who are thinking either nothing like you, or if you're not in the zone, you're not in the right place to talk to a certain kind of person. You still need to be able to communicate Mm. with people. And uh, my grandmother in Toronto, who's a very proper old lady Mm. you know (laughs) like you you open the door you're holding it for like Mm. you know she'd stop if i didn't open and that was just at the time i was like oh just go through the door but be like (laughs) let me walk through the door and then you can walk through the door and we'll both open it or whatever but now i I open a door and if someone's behind me i'm holding it open for them and it's because she did things like that Mm. so and you know with her it was always go to museums or um do a lot of critical thinking she'd ask you very Oh, really? Oh, very pointed podcasty questions. I'm like seven years old and I go, I really like turtles, you know, <laughs> whatever it is. And she goes, oh, why do you like turtles? Like, what is it about turtles that you like? And she makes you think like that. Wow. And as, as a kid, you're just like, oh, I don't know. Because they're, I don't know, they're cute and their faces go in and out and whatever it is. <laughs> but And she'd accept any answer, but you had to have an answer. You couldn't just like something oh that's good to have someone like that around at a young not age. well you don't like it until you love you're older it. yeah yeah and now i'm just like wow do i appreciate having that and that was like critical thinking 101 and i'm a big believer in nurture over over nature and i know nature plays a big part in kind of the way you develop but the development itself is like you've got to have people around you who force you to think like this yeah, nurture is actually very very important i mean yeah, sure, there's, like, genetic predispositions for certain things, but uh, based on environment and, how, like, how you were raised and stuff, th- there was a, this actually this study called the Dunedin Study, and okay. it was basically done in New Zealand. I think the town is called Dunedin or the city. Or oh, okay, yeah, yeah. I don't know exactly how it works, but they took 1,000 people since they were born, and they're the most studied people. So imagine if you're studied all this confidentiality agreements, all your most messed up thoughts and everything, it's all documented. Wow. And they found out that the temperament that you have when you're three years old is the most likely you're going to have when you're 30 years old. Hmm. And so that comes from environment. That comes from di- different things that, that play a role in that. So another study they found is that people that like have hol- like so a Holocaust survivor, right? They're most like, they're more likely to express different uh, things on their on their genes. So like genes, how they work, they're just on your DNA, right? Right. So then, there's a certain group of of those letters or whatever that produce a specific hormone, pretty okay. much. So you have your stress hormones. Everybody has those genes, right? But then because of the Holocaust, because of stressful events, Indigenous people have have that too they it's more methylated so it makes it hyperactive and therefore they have more stress hormones wow so it actually is 
nurture and nature. Yeah. But they uh, combine. They combine. Huh. Yeah, that's called epigenetics for everybody who doesn't know. It's just basically environment. I'm going to write that down. Yeah, environment yeah, affects the genetics and yeah, another cool thing too just to add into that is that there's a certain subset of people that actually if they smoke marijuana, they will become schizophrenic. Really? Yeah. People just have a certain specific pre genetic predisposition if you smoke marijuana. So, wow. Yeah. But anyways, so yeah, just your nature versus nurture. Yeah. You're na- you're uh, I'm a nurture, nurture guy, but I I can say that and yet is probably a, there's natural things in there that's helping mm. that along or or hindering it in in places, but I think it's really important to like get your kids to spend time with really different people. And that doesn't mean like culturally racially sure you know that's great but like people who think differently who if you think a certain way they think very differently there's a great quote from one of my favorite shows where the guy said um if you're dumb surround yourself with smart people and if you're smart surround yourself with smart people who disagree with you (laughs) because you that's how you learn and that's how you grow and uh that's sort of how i was raised like people asking me questions encouraging me to talk a lot so i got used to talking a lot and a lot of it was bullshit (laughs) but eventually you you get a hang on uh on how to deal with with people of different kinds so if you're used to talking to people who are always like you know talking to you a certain way then when you're talking to someone who doesn't like that or who isn't used to that they're going to react to you differently and you're just gonna be like what do i do you know Mm -hmm. so critical thinking was a huge part of my childhood that's good though. Yeah. That's a good, valuable skill. Like if you yeah. ever wanted to get in any kind of like professional school or anything, I mean, being able to critically think is a huge part. Yeah. So and, and being that, self-aware, it helps. Like the emotional part is that self-awareness too. Like because it's hard to critically think when you're put on the spot by someone who's not thinking that way, and you're trying to explain something to them. But just get that out there. Like get people to talk to you in different ways and talk to them back yeah. because it's tough that's uh, sorry i just want to add in here oh yeah for sure really important point that i didn't realize till i was older but i'm sure you've experienced it like with being put on the spot and being able to, like being forced to critically think yeah as a as a young child you were definitely embarrassed you definitely screwed up you definitely said stupid stuff but i feel like now that i'm older and looking back those moments actually really help you for later on in life and at that moment i was like really embarrassed like oh i just remember this one thing (laughs) i was at the gym i was at gym class yeah and i was pretty chubby kid at the time right i was in grade three in that inner city school right and everybody had to so it was basically the girls change room the boys change room and then the door outside to like the classroom was closed but it was right beside them yeah so like the boys and the girls had to line up and everybody got ready first and then it was just me in there I was like, oh, I have to hurry up. So I grabbed all my stuff, grabbed my shirt, was holding all like my stuff. And then I came outside, didn't have a shirt on. <laughs> and I was just like, oh. And then everybody's just like ha, ha, laughing at me. And I was just like, oh, that's so embarrassing. And that's some shit you probably still dream about, right? Like <laughs> yeah. that, that sticks with you. And now those are my best stories. Those are the ones I want to tell the most. In uh, early on, I think it was grade, grade six, um, well, first of all, grade two, I came to, sh- to school in boxers thinking they were shorts. <laughs> my mom got me. I had never had a pair of boxers before. Uh, I was always a tighties guy. So my mom got me a <laughs> pair of boxers and I think she said they were shorts or no one knew what the hell was going on. But I went to school in that. And this fucking kid, Carson, I'll never forget his name. Just like, why are you in your underwear? I'm like, dude, these are shorts. I spent the whole day arguing with him. I knew immediately when he said it that they weren't shorts, but I, I wasn't going to let down. Otherwise, what am I going to do? Yeah. <laughs> I'm stuck the whole day in my underwear. <laughs> uh, no. I had underwear on underneath, but it was fine. Oh, okay. But that embarrassing shit sticks with you, but it's so important to development, right? Oh, I, I just remember, just to interject before you go on your next yeah, point. please. Huge point as a young as a young as a child, male child going into an adult man, yeah, biggest transition from tidy whities like your dad to boxers, to like boxers. all the cool kids. It's you a know? huge transition. See, I forgot about that yeah. actually. Until I now. came back a little bit then oh, with the okay. sacks. So I was like, okay, oh, I can wear these. Yeah. yeah, they're like tight boxers though. They're tight-ish, but they have that that fold that just holds your junk properly, and it's like 
It's mm. prime. <laughs> yeah, I know. Because sometimes, good. especially uh, playing soccer, I'm like, I can't wear the boxers oh. to play soccer. That does not work. Especially when you're a goalie, you might take a shot. Oh. Yeah, you need that packed. You need oh. that good to go. <laughs> yeah. No no give on that. Just a, just a bit of, of sponginess. But, uh, <laughs> but that embarrassing stuff. It, the same kid, Carson, we went to school you know, together for that long. And in grade <laughs> six, I, uh, I went to the washroom. And just took a piss. And about partway through, I realized I hadn't taken my pants off. <laughs> Literally just standing in front of the toilet, pissed my pants. Oh, my. Right? And uh, that shit spread very quickly. Oh. So by then, right, critical thinking, like, how can I get out of this with my dignity? So I went out and I told everyone <laughs> that, the, uh, that the sink overflowed. Oh, my God. <laughs> That I was washing my hands and the sink had overflowed onto my pants. And almost everyone bought it. At least in my grade. That fucking Carson kid sitting there. Oh, <laughs> I'm no. telling the story. The The teacher's going to get me some pants from Lost and Found while I'm standing there in the computer class with my, my piss-stained <laughs> shorts. And uh, the car- Carson leans in really slow. He goes, smells like piss. <laughs> oh. Uh, fucking Carson! <laughs> I fuck, still think about that. I'm yeah. like, no, it's water. Fuck you, Carson. Fuck you. Yeah. <laughs> Can we? So, just gonna t- Wherever he is. That actually reminds me of another story, though. When I was in elementary, wow, all these memories are just coming out of yeah. the the, cave. the woodwork. Yeah, I remember there was this one guy who peed peed his pants a lot and he smelled really bad all the time. Like I hate saying this, but he just I don't know if it was a condition or something, but I just remember one time we were in computer lab and. He peed his pants, and then Miss Forrest came up to me and was like, Justin, um, Jordan peed his pants, and, uh... Are you Carson? (laughs) Yeah, no, no, she's like, Jordan peed his pants, um, can you use your gym clothes? Like, (laughs) I guess, like, I don't know. Yeah, you you can't, you want to say yes, but in your mind, you're like, I don't know, man. (laughs) I got it. I'm put on the spot, right? Yeah, I was like, yes. yeah, you could just keep it, I guess. But yeah. yeah. <laughs> but stories like that, eventually, you own it enough times, or you get out of it, and you think like, I'm a, I'm a pretty good liar. I can, <laughs> I can talk my way out oh, of shit, yeah. and eventually it stops becoming lies. You you figure out how to talk your way out of shit, without, you know, lying, without lying or being a complete phony. Um. So I just got used to talking a lot. And it was like, the longer you talk, the more people like, and it's weird. And, and you, you start to relate to like Trump supporters and things like that. Cause you go, I get it. Like he's, he's spouting bullshit, but at the same time, it's like strong, strong speaking. The thing with the, with the, with that whole situation is like, I feel that the reason why Trump supporters are a thing are just because the left were just bashing anybody <clears throat> who wasn't with them. Yep. If you're not Democrat, you're an idiot. Like yeah. that's what the agenda was. It was like you're a It's vilifying a the opposite. It's yeah. so counterproductive. It's so counterproductive and then they have that. But then all I think in my head is like, hey, if you had to pick Hillary Clinton or Donald Trump I think we'd be in worse shape if we had Hillary. But Ooh, yeah. Like, the country might be in worse shape, like, economically and maybe in a couple other ways. And then you, you just wonder, like, all this villainy and all this, like, infighting, would that still be going on? That's the thing, right? Because I don't think it would because, like, the left control the media. I just remember in that group chat yesterday, at work, in our work group chat, yeah. when I just made a joke about because one of our coworkers, Stephanie, <laughs> was in the trash can, yeah. and it was a joke, and me and Stephanie are really, really close for yeah. people who don't know. Like, we're friends. And I was like, oh, look, she's where she belongs. That's all <laughs> I said. And then, like, literally, like, five people are like, oh, yeah, that's the patriarchy. And I'm like, that – no, you guys don't know what you're talking about. And then I'm like, it's not. I was just making a joke about my friend sitting in trash. This is not patriarchy. I was like – I, I know my stuff, you yeah. know, like I'm, cu- I'm culturally competent. I know what, what the careful culture yeah. is, is really here. And it's, it's the backlash to like, like I said, all this, the racism and sexism and things that are, that are coming out and kind of being dealt with mm-hmm. are while they're being dealt with are getting all of the pain back at them. So everyone who's even felt slightly like that or thinks that you know they're on the right side of the fence but they don't understand how to separate the stuff from the stuff yeah so you're either with or against you're not 
you you can't say those little things and get away with it anymore and people say well that's a good thing i was like it's a good thing we're fighting that but we gotta find a middle ground where you can make a joke oh, to a yeah. close friend no. around other friends and not be um, called out for being something you're not when they don't take that context i know it's like right when i and the thing is right when i told them like like right when I explained myself and proved that I wasn't actually sit, like doing anything patriarchal, <laughs> then they're like, yeah. "Oh yeah, we were just joking. We were at work. We were just planning." I'm like, "Oh yeah, sure. Yeah, okay. okay, you guys were pretending to be like that, but whatever. I mean, you know, Emily watches the show, so you know, I'll give her, I'll give her one. <laughs> just kidding. No, she was probably joking. But it's uh, it's tough. It's it's really tough because we're on that knife's edge right now, and we're getting better, but." There's a lot of fighting because of it. So, yeah, because of we got to get over that. Yeah. That's rough. Yeah, because honestly, there's just no way to. We just have no idea when the left goes too far. That's it. Yeah. It's just, we, we know when the right is, and we just don't really know when the left is because there's just a gray area. And until we do know that, then it's just nothing's going to be solved. But yeah, the, the right problems seem to be pretty obvious and out in the open. And, uh, and the left stuff, it's like, well, you got to give and take and you got to, that's again, part of critical thinking. People who think critically aren't necessarily self-aware and they don't get that. That means yourself too. Mm. You can, you can take information and be skeptical about it. Um, but critical thinking goes both ways. And if you're not self-aware while you're talking. No. And see, that's the way, and see, that's the way to, that I go about things. And, and I, I did mention that in my p- p- uh, podcast with Patrick yeah. was just, you know, the the only way we can move forward is just if we have open dialect on both sides and we actually just, like, have debates and, yeah. and we talk. We, it's not like I, – I can't even watch the news anymore because oh. it's just like you're just trying to get your, your little point in in, like, 10 seconds. Yeah, and, and it's not about – for them, it's not about having a, a debate where you come out with a better understanding. It, for them, it's trying to win the argument. Oh, yeah. And that's a serious problem with the way people argue now is – Everyone's very, they feel so accountable because their information's out there. It's on the internet. It's like solidified. So they feel like they have to commit so hard that God forbid you say, oh, well, you know what? You have a point there. I can backtrack. I made a post recently (laughs) about how much I hated the movie Bird Box. Oh, yeah. And uh, the backlash on that was pretty harsh um, and I can take it. But at some point, you know. I, I talked with a couple people about it. They're like, oh, who do you like? Why do you hate Sandra Bullock so much? And I explained my reasons. And at some point they go, yeah, but this, this, and this. And I thought about it a little bit. And I'm like, okay, you know what? There are movies I like her in. And there are movies I like her in because of her. So I made like a like a later post like, oh, all right. I concede Sandra Bullock is all right. No. You know, yeah. I just hated Bird Box. But it's, it's unbelievable how few people will do that. Will just come out and say, I was wrong. No, and and Whew. the most in- the world didn't end. <laughs> the, mo- the most intelligent people are the ones that are open to changing their mind. Yeah, that's th- yeah, that's one of the biggest. And things. that's what science is about. That's why science for me was always the winner over religion. And I did not have a religious upbringing. Um, we, we celebrated Christmas and Hanukkah, but uh, I, I think I only went to church like twice, maybe. And it was my dad's family is uh, Anglican, so it's like christian light they mm, you know yeah we say a prayer before a meal and that's like as far as it went mm-hmm. but uh the reason science always wins for me is because they're willing to say they were wrong yeah and it's freaky how much backlash they'll get from people who claim to be scientific like pluto's not a planet anymore what do you mean pluto's not yeah. a planet anymore i learned that when i was a kid that's science yeah. like no these are the scientists the same people who said it was are now like you know what it isn't it's <laughs> not the biggest mass in its orbit so no yeah. <laughs> and i'm like cool Science is willing to say we were wrong, and I get why people might be, oh, well, then how do you trust it if it's just always wrong? It's like, yeah. well, it's, like, it's look, testing itself all the time. It's like, look how far we've gone in yeah. just civilization. Like, yeah. We can live long. And, yeah, that's a weird t- subject, like the religion. Like, I remember just growing up, I was always just like, because my mom's side's Jewish, my dad's side's really strict Mennonite Christian. So... At my grandma's, who is on my dad's side, yeah. I'm Christian. When I'm at my baba's, I'm Jewish. So then I'm, you know, an adult, and I'm like, uh, what am I? <laughs> and then, so... So you learn to define yourself in another yeah, way. But Yeah, but I was always just like, okay, science is the end-all, be-all, like, blah, blah, blah. But the thing is, though, I've actually been thinking about this. I'm glad we came to this point. Yeah. 
So religion in itself, like Christianity, for example, has so many good inherent values within it. Um, just for example, like it's a good baseline to live your life because if you don't, because example, if you have no religion, no values, you can just literally do whatever you want and no consequences besides like jail and other people. Yeah. But like you get really no personal consequences. You have no conscience. baseline ethics, baseline ethics. Right. So yeah, that's true. It's like a baseline for everybody. And what I was thinking is like, if you are, so I, as I'm growing up, I'm realizing, okay, there actually are some really important benefits to having religion, whether you believe in it or not. It has a good baseline ethics. You can't really do too much harm. There's always something watching over you that, that would suggest would 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 steer you in in the better direction yeah. but what i've just thought about you know how i don't really know if you believe in karma or not but i feel like that is almost like a baseline ethic for atheists i mean people with religion can believe in it or not but i feel like every atheist should not should but i feel like it would be in their best interest to f to believe in karma or something yeah, to form a baseline. Mm -hmm. I believe in in randomness, and I can only say that now because I've I've had the religious perspective very mildly, but enough to know that this is out there and it's important to a lot of people, mm -hmm. and I should treat it with respect, even if I don't necessarily agree with it. Um, but and I when you said that, I thought of. Something like a like a school shooting. You're talking about karma, right? Mm -hmm. And the idea that bad things will happen to bad people. And I don't necessarily, I don't think I believe that. But um, oh. the the re chaos is scary, and I think it's more important to um, to react to things with sympathy than it is with um, with immediate analytics. Because as as good as critical thinking is, if you don't have that emotional um, thinking as well, like an emotional critique of what's going on. A school shooting happens and everyone immediately wants to do something about it because they feel like there's something can be done. Mm -hmm. And these people who do these terrible things or, you know, just bad people, it, it actually can just happen and you can't prepare in every way. There is no way to stop a lot of these things. And that's a very scary idea. Cause it's like, well, then I guess it'll just happen and we shouldn't, but mm. don't go in it. Don't be an extremist is really yeah. it. Don't feel like you have to do everything to stop like one bad thing from happening. Bad things absolutely will happen. You can't stop them. Mm -hmm. And that's scary. But at the same time, it's like, what's more important, the emotional support in reaction and like an amount of preparedness that emotional preparedness so that the people, these people don't turn into those people, like keep people from becoming extremists because a reaction to, Something like a school shooting of like, hey, put more guns in people's hands or put like electric fences around the schools and shit like that. It's mm -hmm. like people will find a way past that. It's it's the hacker thing of as technology increases, so does like crime. And like yeah. they're always going to try and one up each other and someone's going to find a way through every time. But that extreme thinking and reaction to it encourages the kind of extreme thinking that would cause it, in my opinion. So I think it's more important to be sympathetic to the people who've had bad shit happen to them and not say, Oh, you know, those bad guys will be smited and they'll have terrible lives and whatever. Like if they're, hopefully they're caught or whatever happens happens, but um, just don't react with extremism to extremism. I think. Well, that is a good point. Um, so that emotional, as good as critical thinking is, if you're just like a, like a robot to it, you're going to lose some part of what makes us like human. Well, yeah, that's why you, uh, you got to be a mix of like science and art. That's that's, yeah. why, that's why I'm so drawn to medicine be, because as a profession, it's a mix between science and art. It's a mix between the analytical and what's the other word? Analytical and the, the emotional. Yeah, and the emotional. Because you're dealing with sick people. Yeah. yeah. Like. So it's like a good mix of both, and that's how I feel like you should live your life. And what we were just touching on before, how you we're learning how to be a critical thinker, practicing with different, getting the different perspectives of different people really helped you pave the way to be able to put yourself in other people's shoes. Yeah. And I feel like that's a huge thing that, that really might not help you at much just because sometimes when you're a little too empathetic, it might hinder you more than yeah. help you. Like for example, one of my good friends is 
not very empathetic, not really able to put himself in other people's shoes yet. And he doesn't have any worries. You know, if he does dick move, then <laughs> it doesn't bother him as much. Yeah. It's does not hindering him. But for me, if I'm, you know, oh, um, if I don't go out tonight, am I going to really offend this person? And, oh, yeah. yeah. Oh, if it leads you to inaction, then it's probably not healthy. Yeah. Um, proactive thinking. And empathy can even help you in those situations. If you're worried about, like, embarrassing, being embarrassed or embarrassing someone by doing a certain thing, putting yourself in their shoes really helps. Like, if I think I'm going to say something stupid or I'm worried about something I have said that's stupid, it doesn't last long because I imagine myself as them hearing me say a stupid thing. Like, how much do you really... We're all pretty selfish people. Like, we don't often... We give people leeway because we don't necessarily care how many mistakes they make if someone makes a mistake in front of me i'm not gonna you know go home and talk about it for an hour with someone like i can't believe this guy said that stupid thing what an idiot i I don't do that and almost i can't i can think of so few people who actually do that (laughs) that when i make a mistake i'm like they don't care they'll forget about it in in a 10 minute so why shouldn't i but that's just the thing about kind of related to mindfulness i was listening to sam harris one uh one day yeah and he was just talking about the feeling of being embarrassed or feeling of being mad, it doesn't last. No. It lasts for five to ten seconds. What lasts is the afterthought. So say you say something stupid, whatever. Yeah. And then after, okay, you're, you're upset, whatever, five, ten seconds. And then what is the residual effect is you being, oh, wait, so you think they're going to worry about, do you think they're going to talk about me after? Like, did I look like an idiot? Like, all these different thoughts, and those carry on. So yeah. b- the point of being mindful is just to let that go. Yeah. And so sometimes if I screw up or say something stupid, I'm just like, oh, whatever. Yeah. It happened. Who's really going to judge me for it? And the kind of people, and you got to remember this too, yes, maybe there is someone who's going to be like, what an idiot. I don't want to be around that person anymore. They said some stupid shit. Those are the kind of people you don't want to be around anyway. So who cares what they think of you? Yeah, exactly. The people who you like are going to forgive you or not care. And the people who are really going to take it seriously are probably the people you don't want to be around. So just chill about things. (laughs) Like it's so much easier to be chill. And and we work with a lot of young people who get really stressed about these tiny social things that I just, it really, talk about perspective, like the perspective of being younger than I am now and being like, did I used to, think this way that i used to like say some of the things i say and, and i i love most of the people we work with but who they just need to like whew, take deep a deep breath, breath. yeah <laughs> chill like i'm super i'm just super relaxed it's like yeah. i just remember when i was younger it, like a couple years ago even I, if i didn't have a table and that was my table i'm gonna <laughs> kill you yeah, but then it's like i see all these young these young uh, ladies and, and males and they're just like freaking the heck out yeah. because they don't have a table and it's like oh so what you're missing like five ten bucks like at the end of the day as long as, as we're making really good money yeah. and so i'm not gonna complain i'm just gonna ride the wave enjoy okay so that's all that means if someone has your table it just means that you get to do a little bit less yeah. and chill and if you're not making good money it's so easy for us to just pick up shifts <laughs> and stay like don't you're like oh no money I, do i sign the sheet do i not sign? just stick around and make some money like i'm ama- i'm still amazed every day about how two hours of work can set someone off with like how they oh i only made you know 40 bucks and like 40 bucks in two hours like it's like any other retail job i've had i'm stuck there for eight hours making less money than i do in four no so if you think about it so two hours right yeah Two hours you make, okay, let's just say 50 bucks. Sure. And then, which is reasonable some days. Yeah. And then, so you get, um, so then you get the wage. It's like 11, 11. So that's like yeah. $72 in two hours. And then if you're working retail for seven hours, it's like seven, it's like 80 or something. Yeah. And it's just like, how mad. much more time are you getting to yourself? And how much more chill is it to be there and have that kind of flexibility? Yeah. And it's, it's, I understand that it's very inconsistent and that can be absolutely worrisome. At least if you're like a heavy budgeter, like how do you budget when you don't know how a day is going to go or how long you're going to be there, how much tips you're going to make. That's can be scary. Um, but who do we have it a lot better (laughs) than people treat it? I know. It's like, I could totally, if you really want to make good money, get a morning job and then just work all nights or vice versa. And 
just have the the consistency and then the f- the fluctuating yeah. job. But. And that's a lot of your life, you know. It feels like wasted, but do that for a little while and then go back. You know, mm-hmm. just do what you got to do. It's it's not too too tough. And I wish I'd known that earlier because I went through a lot of shit jobs um, when I moved back. I didn't get a real job, or I wasn't able to until I moved back. So I was 18 before I had my first real job, and uh, that's spooky stuff. Oh, shit. Um, but I was also thrown into, like, living alone and, and dealing with other people on a daily basis that aren't my family. Like, there's a big difference, and when I go home now, it's unbelievable how relaxed I am. Mm. I'm just like, I forgot what it was like to just <laughs> not to just be able to sit around at my family's house and not worry if I'm, like, overstepping my bounds. <laughs> mm-hmm. That's... That, and that leads to a lot of my personal stress was just I'm I'm out the door when I'm 18, kind of on my own. My parents are in another continent. And even when they moved back, they moved to Kitchener because it was wherever my dad could get a job. And it was like, I don't have, I have family here and I have very close family here, but it's not the same as like your immediate family's home. And mm-hmm. there is this, this security you really got to appreciate because... And it's another reason I would advocate for living on your own because, oh boy, is it is it a release to mm. just not worry about those tiny little things. When you're living with someone else, a fr- even a friend, like a really close friend, you you don't, it's their, it's their space. And even when you're chill there and you can kind of, they're relaxed, you can do whatever you want. There's something in the back of your mind um, that says we can't, I can't go too far i can't sit around as long as i want i ha- i should be helping out i should be um i should be trying to be hospitable whatever it is but there's some kind of stress in there when it's not your immediate family do you remember when when you were a kid and blooper reels were like a big thing it was like so important to see behind the scenes <laughs> That you almost didn't give a shit what you were watching as long as you could see the bloopers. <laughs> yeah. I remember when we first got our hands on, like, personal cameras, people would um, just do blooper reels for, like, five-minute videos they made. I'm like, who cares what mistake, like, what's the actual thing we're seeing the bloopers for? They care more about the bloopers than the real thing. I find that so fascinating. Like, before the internet and you got to know everything that happened behind something, no, you yeah. had to like those blooper reels were like ooh there is stuff ha- this isn't real there's things <laughs> happening behind the scenes these are real people and now it's everywhere and i don't know i kind of miss that but uh i do miss the old internet but before we go on another tangent yes talk about some crazy stories okay uh i used to go on a lot of adventures with my dad um like crazy adventure we we walked up a mountain together oh wow in in banff um or was it jasper Sulphur Mountain, I think it was called. And uh, my dad and I were like, yeah, let's, let's go up the mountain. <laughs> it wasn't a mountain climb. It was just a hike. Um, but it's one of those things you do <laughs> when you're young and your dad's like, we could do this thing. And I'm like, yeah, we have crackers. We got this. Oh. He had to take a shit halfway up the mountain, wipe his butt with leaves, and I had to watch <laughs> out for people. And we get most of the way up the mountain. And my, my mom and sister just took the gondola up. And they, they basically browsed the gift shop for uh. four hours while we walked up this mountain. I'm like, you guys should have just gone with us. Uh, and most of the other adventures where they were around, they just sort of had to wait. Uh. They could have come, but I, I don't know. Um, <laughs> that didn't happen. Anyways, we're most of the way up this mountain. And my, I see like five shirtless super buff dudes just running down the mountain. <laughs> And they're loving it. It's starting to rain. Like, things are not going well. And one of the dudes passes me. I I see, like, what I think is my jacket. And he just passes it to me. He's like, your mom sent me this to give to you. I'm like, the (laughs) fuck? (laughs) Uh, You can kind of see the top of the mountain from here, but not really. I didn't know she was up there. But apparently she'd just given my jacket to some shirtless dudes (laughs) to give to me on their way down. I just picture my son's down there somewhere. Please give him this jacket. Uh, we went on a lot of a lot of weird adventures. <laughs> That's my interesting. dad and I. Yeah, we used to do a lot of rock hunting. Rock hunting. Yeah, you ever been to Suris? No, I've not done much in my life. Okay. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> uh, my dad's super into rocks, like interesting types of stones and geodes and things like that. Oh, and he, really? he had a tumbler in our basement. My mom still has like PTSD about 
our storage room being filled with rocks and nothing else. Uh, and he'd tumble rocks and we had really interesting, like and we went to amethyst mines and we went to a gold mine once. And uh, Suris is a place here in Manitoba that I guess, I don't know how, and I don't know the history, but they have a huge quarry where just cool, it's a cool area where a lot of rocks have been dug up and you can just drive into this big old quarry and search the piles for interesting things like mostly agates, stuff like that, you know, things you can, translucent rocks you can see oh. through and like just interesting colored rocks. He'd teach me the names of those and we would just go for a day and just sift through piles of rocks and find interesting ones <laughs> and keep all the, the cool agates and things like that we found. And um, we used to go down to Minidosa and hunt fossils. I don't know how he heard about this. He must have been following some rock hunting forum or whatever. And I don't even know what the fossils were of. But th just off the bridge in some random area, we would like comb the walls of, uh, of dirt that had been shaved away near this river to make the bridge. And we found fossils and shit. And it's so weird thinking of that now. I'm like, don't all kids like go and hunt yeah. rocks and <laughs> shit with their dad for like a whole day? <laughs> I didn't even know that was a thing. <laughs> right? Yeah. Uh, but that's the kind of thing we did. And um, and it translated the longer, the longer life went on. We'd just go on an adventure every now and again. So we, when we lived in Abu Dhabi, we got a free trip back every year in the summer. So we could come visit family and things mm. like that. And... Uh, for me, it was like an excuse to come back and visit my girlfriend, who that's a whole rigmarole that, in itself. That's a whole different podcast. That's a that's a whole different podcast on relationships. Like, whew. Yeah. <laughs> but. Uh, oh, I've had my fair share of bad, bad. <laughs> yeah, but yeah. all good. That Yeah, we could actually have a relationship episode. For sure. I would day. be, I would have an episode worth of stuff to, to talk about. But anyways, we got this free trip back every year and we were kind of able to stop wherever we wanted on the way depending on what airline we took. So we stopped in Amsterdam. We stopped in uh, England, France, Italy, places like that. And we decided to, one of the years, stay in Italy for a little while, like 10 days or something like that. And not in the touristy areas, but in the in the country, like oh. way out in the, the kind of place where it's not crowded. Uh, and there are just amazing caves out there. And we stayed in a, in a little farmhouse near a town called Petigliano which is a town on a cliff. <laughs> like, just old... You look at it from afar and you're like, that's some fantasy medieval shit right there. <laughs> just a walled town straight up on a cliff and to drive into it, you're you're on a 45-degree angle ramp that you have to then turn and go up another 45-degree oh, wow. angles and it's the scariest shit to be driving in, especially when you're in a, a standard, which my dad loved driving. Oh but my we, goodness. Yeah. <laughs> So uh, my parents never had a standard. I didn't. I didn't know my dad knew how to drive standard, but he was he was gearing it up on the highways. Highways don't even have freaking railings around the the curves, so you're ready to fall off at any time. Anyways, we're on this cliff, and my dad's like, "We should go to Rome." <laughs> I went, and Rome's pretty far. I think it was like a three hour drive from where we were. And my sister was either sick or just not feeling good that day, so my mom stayed with her, and my dad and I did our thing. Like, okay, we'll go to Rome. And uh, you can't drive around in Rome. You can't go anywhere in Rome. That city is huge and old, and they don't let you change a light bulb without 10 days worth of paperwork because everything has to remain touristy and old. Oh. I feel so bad for people who live in Europe in all these tourist oh, areas. Like, yeah. how do you live in a place that is ancient and you don't have to change? I know, I know there's old pictures of the city here and yeah. things like, like old buildings and people go, you know, preserve that stuff. I'm like, tear it the fuck down. Yeah. Let us, <laughs> let people live there. Oh yeah. Cause as much as it is important to like preserve culture and history, there's a, there's a limit and people got to live there. And I feel so bad for anyone who lives in Rome. Shout out to Romans. Shout out to Rome. <laughs> <laughs> um, and we found some really crazy stuff on the way. We walked for seven hours straight just through we did the St. Peter's Basilica and then we came all the way out of Vatican city and just down the city. And the most interesting shit we found was not on the tourist like path, you know, okay. it's the things you find along the way that kind of boggle your mind. We found a, a place that I thought was some ancient military structure. And it turns out 
was like the Victor Emmanuel II. It was like the first real king of Italy. They built it for him in the 1800s. not even that old. Oh, wow. And it was way more beautiful than the Colosseum. Oh. I was huh. like, this is awesome. We were just like, let's go see the Colosseum. And we find these amazing things on their way. And uh, it's it's wacky how when you decide to do something and you don't really care how you do it, how much interest you find along the way. And the way better stories come from the shit we didn't mean to do mm. and i think i think culture becoming cultured is like it's a way of living not a way of like it, it's not cheap you don't you don't go to a place for a week and say you've learned mm. the way it works like it's the way people live there and the way that um the way they do things and the way you realize how either easy you have it or how different you have it some some huge uh some huge differences there um i tried to sell my sister to for some camels once <laughs> that was fun yeah uh, <laughs> living in abu dhabi it's weird because you'd think there'd be like crazy stories about arabic stuff but it's mostly just it's the same kind of stories you'd have here just like can, it's just like canada but over there kind of sort of uh, but only in the way where it's not the culture itself isn't what's making the stories you can have a story anywhere Um, but we, you know, if you're in, when in Rome or whatever, when in Abu Dhabi, go see the camels and these camel sellers were not used to seeing white people and they were like touching my sister. Like it was creepy. Like they hands in the car, like appraising her. I was like three camels. (laughs) I almost sold it for some camels, but, uh. I don't know what I would have done with those camels. I'm glad I I'm glad I didn't sell her. Yeah, maybe with camels, maybe there. It's amazing how different things are out there. Um, the speed limit, they're like 160 hard, 160 kilometers on the highway is the speed limit. Oh, if that's you, a speed limit. That's the speed limit. So people go like 170, 182. Well, <laughs> yeah. the the idea is like that's a hard limit. If you touch 160 and go over, you're oh. done. But go whatever you want up to there. So people just fucking floor in it on these eight lane highways. You go from Abu, Abu Dhabi to Dubai was about a, an hour away. Um, and the highway was eight lanes the entire way. Like oh, wow. beautiful brand new roads. Maybe some sand is blown over. But other than that, you're just driving. You're just flooring it. And there's streetlights for an hour. It's like you're driving in Toronto. For like it, it just never stops. And, and there's no one. There's like maybe four other people on the road because no one does that much. Uh driving except the people to and from work every day who like worked in dubai so you'd get people speeding along and you'd see um traffic signs that weren't written they were tried they tried to write them in english but no one translated or gave a shit so you'd get like safety first but no e so my parents and i always say safety first now because there's <laughs> there's no safe in in safety um <laughs> but yeah we went to markets and and it's it's so weird trying to think of like a specific long story because it's just crazy shit that happens every now and again that you think I'm not in Kansas anymore kind of thing. Yeah. We got there the first time we arrived in the airport in Dubai and the Dubai airport's huge and it's big and there's these beautiful things all over the ceiling and it's like you're in some kind of giant chapel. So I'm looking up and I'm just like, ooh, and we're walking down and I think it's 3 a.m. or something. No one else is in there. And I look down and there's a woman in full burqa and like the whole thing but she also had the mask some of them i can't remember what it's called but they wear like a small metal sort of mask over it oh i didn't know that yeah it's not like a full like it doesn't cover that much but it's just it comes like over the forehead and around the the sides and there she was i never seen someone like that up close and i screamed (laughs) just screamed right in her face like "Ah!" (laughs) she laughed and found it and found it funny but that's that was the first literal culture shock. And after that, literal, it, culture, literal shock. culture shock, I was scared shitless by just a woman in, in full black. And, uh, <laughs> it's incredible how quick you get used to that stuff and scary. So I absolutely encourage if you want to like travel and get good at being cultured and like learning new things, don't go for a week and see all the touristy bits and then leave, mm. go and like live there for a month and like make friends and get to know people because then you really learn 
like what it, how the same everyone is and how quickly you can adjust to being in a completely different continent a completely different culture um there was no it people go like oh that was a great experience it must have been so different i'm like i guess it was different but it felt like home it felt normal after a very short time oh yeah i skipped school a lot in uh, <laughs> abu dhabi i was not a good student <laughs> No. Uh, our school was not a, a a traditional like it wasn't built to be a school it was built to be like an apartment villa oh. um they have villas out there and my classrooms were like apartment rooms oh. <laughs> <laughs> there were four buildings there was like the kindergarten to grade three building or whatever and the office building but all of these were just their own apartments and the school in between <laughs> was only connected by the wall around it which you had to have some kind of pass to get it to leave. Oh, okay. So we would hop the, the fence at the end and go wherever we wanted. Um, but see, kids are the same everywhere. Kids are the same everywhere. Yeah, that's crazy. And I would skip. I had a really good friend from Jordan. Uh, he and I played basketball every day for maybe three years. Just at lunch, just shoot hoops. Out in the sun, the like plus forty degree weather that it is in the summer. It's so fucking brutal summer that must be okay i know plus 40 sounds a little extreme but just i couldn't imagine living in a place that's always warm i would love you could go jogging every day yeah you know you could wake up you could just throw on a shirt shorts boom go and and as incredible as that is and as much as you can do uh it still becomes uh you find an excuse no matter what no matter where you are there's people like eh i won't go outside today just because there's some other excuse it's too hot out um, but unfortunately, in the UAE, their solution to the constant heat is to crank the AC to unbearable levels anywhere indoors that's public. You want to go into a mall, you better bring a sweater. Oh, it's that cold. It's that cold. They like it fucking freezing cold inside. <laughs> and it like the kind of weather where as soon as you walk outside, there is an instant layer of moisture all over your skin. Like instant sweat. If you have glasses, good luck. Those are fogged oh. immediately. <laughs> like if you have defrosters, you're you're okay. <laughs> But uh, you get sick a lot because you're going from extreme cold, extreme cold to extreme heat over oh. and over again. If you're just if you're just walking around, you're going in the mall, out of the mall, into a restaurant, out of the restaurant. So people are walking around in long sleeves and jeans, and there are pictures of me. I don't remember this. I'm thinking now, like, boy, plus forty would be would be rough now that I'm mm. accustomed to the Canadian climate again. But I, there's pictures of me and I would be walking around with long sleeve and, and jeans in plus 40 <laughs> weather. I'm like, huh, I guess people will just accustom and acclimate and, and not really respect the, the weather no matter what. Oh, yeah. No one actually gives a shit no matter where you are. Um, but the heat absolutely fucks with you if you take advantage of it. Mm. Um, our school was kind of in the middle of nowhere, just sort of out in the... The suburbs, I guess, the deep suburbs where there's nothing to do. Um, and if we wanted to skip school, we better have had a plan to go somewhere. Now, you, uh, you can cab anywhere in the city for extremely cheap, like disgustingly cheap to where now that I'm an adult, I'm like, oh, those poor cab drivers. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, I could get from home. You cab no matter what. I'd get from home to the furthest mall in the city for the equivalent of $3. And that's like the same size as Ma- like Manitoba, yeah. for example. So well, Winnipeg, I guess. Winnipeg, yeah. So if you wanted to go from um, yeah. from Polo Park to St. Vitale Center for three bucks, wow. you could absolutely do it. <laughs> and here it's like starts at three fifty. <laughs> yeah. Now this is ten years ago, mind you, but I don't imagine it's gotten much much more expensive considering they're still super wealthy out there and take advantage of the the poor. Um, but if you want to go on a big adventure in the heat, you're going to get, you're going to get burned. I convinced four of my friends to go to the subway. I remember there's a subway at the end of the long road that our school was on. I didn't realize it was an hour and a half walk, uh, in the 40 degree weather, but I thought we'll get there and they've got re my, my thing was refills. They have free refills. So we'll get as much drink as we want. And, uh, <laughs> And I remember my friend from Jordan, Rashid, just dragging his backpack at one point. And it was like, if you had seen a long shot of it, you'd have thought we were trekking through the desert um, (laughs) trying to survive. (laughs) And I just kept motivating them the whole way. (laughs) After an hour and a half, we get to Subway and no one's thirsty. We took like one sip and we felt sick. Oh my God. It was disgusting. That was where we invented Trek sauce, which is a mix of 
Seven Up, Pepsi, and Orange Crush. Mm. Trek sauce because of the trek we went on to get it. Um, mm. TM. Yeah, mm, yeah. TM. Uh, but the deserts, the deserts crazy. There's so many things to do that I wish I'd done. Um, people like will tell you do this, do this, do this. But when you're living there, you just you don't yeah. take advantage of that stuff. You've got your own shit you want to do. So we didn't go on as many adventures as I'd hoped. Um, my dad and I did go out into the dunes a few times once to see what's called the Wonder Wall, mm. which is a giant wall of sand. Oh. But the directions were very vague, and they just said the Wonder Wall's here-ish. <laughs> so we drive around and we go, "Is that the one? That's a pretty big dune. Is that the <laughs> Wonder Wall?" Uh, that's where I learned to drive. Actually, it was in a, a Honda MRV out in the dunes. Wow. He's like, "There's nothing but sand here. You wanna you wanna take the wheel?" I'm like, "Hell yeah!" <laughs> in a big old, big old beautiful truck, and um, you learn pretty quickly how to deal with the sand and the how the hydroplane. Like, how is it? Like, I, I don't understand how you won't, like, sink or anything. It's uh, it's pretty hard on top. Like, they have oh, bits yeah. that they've sort of laid out for a road. There's there's a road there, and it's almost mostly a gravel road. It's just like a very soft gravel road. Um, but the dunes themselves, if you, you just have to have the right car, I'm amazed that it stays on top. But as long as you keep moving, you're good. Mm. And we did actually get stuck at one point. Um, but luckily there was a farmer in his truck with a couple camels that just happened to go by and helped us out. And this is when my booby had come out to, uh, to visit us. And we took her out to Liwa, which is the desert proper. If you're in Abu Dhabi or Dubai in between, it's mostly just like dusty flatland. Oh, okay. Like there's, there's, That's how I imagined it, yeah, yeah, there's a lot of that, but you can just uh, maybe an hour the other way, or you go North and you get those real like oh okay like the sun on the dunes egyptian like beauty um there's a hotel in the middle of the desert uh that we went to i I had an ear infection that day which was absolutely brutal but um it was just this this beautiful round hotel with like an outdoor pool in the middle and you could go dune bashing and like the atvs yeah i wish i had done that we went dune bashing in our mr in the big honda and that was that was a ton of fun dad just like loves to give her on the on the pedal but uh the sand is is beautiful and we did see the wonder wall and we saw rocky mountains and um and like insane insane sandstorms and dunes and hot crazy shit it's it's so weird talking about it now because i just like i lived there and it feels so alien now yeah. and i wish i wish i could just move back i want to take my girlfriend back i want to take her back one day it's super expensive to go out there and be out there if you're not living there uh, oh yeah i know a girl actually that she like is grew up here and everything but i think she's just taking a year of her life just to go work out there for a bit and yeah it's it's she'll get a real it's very it's expensive if you're not paid to be there Uh, because they don't the locals are rich they're oil lords out there like all of them and they don't know real work. So if they want to hire professionals, they hire them from outside the country. That's how my dad got a job teaching at the women's college there. Okay. Um, they were just like, we need people who know how to do stuff to come and do the big jobs. And then for the small jobs, like minimum wage kind of jobs, uh, they get very, very cheap labor from nearby countries and the Philippines and things like that. Okay. Yeah, and and the class system is a, is a little is a little rough out there. It's tough to get used to when it's like supremely rich and then supremely poor. And or? and you're always somewhere in between. Yeah. And there's nothing you can do about the system. Um, like people are being paid, and and it is very cheap to live out there. They've made it extremely cheap to get food, and unless you're going to do some big fancy thing or going out to a hotel which is really expensive uh if you just want to like go across the street and get a burger it's cheaper than you'll ever find it here Mm -hmm. um and they had places where you could get non like traditional non where they would just spread out the dough in front of you and like slap it on the inside of a cylindrical oven and i'd pay 50 fills fills is like cents for them it's like durham's is dollars fills is is uh cents and 50 fills might have been like 10 cents here so for 10 cents i get a huge thing of bread like 
really sweet homemade local oh, bread. Oh, naan bread. So yeah. Good. And this stuff is is spiced differently than naan. It's like it's a little saltier um, mm. and a little a little more crispy. It's like a really flaky. I don't know if you've ever had an aqua pizza, but it's kind of like their crust, like a flakyish. Mm, I know what you're talking about. But it's still about, soft. Yeah. Um, but it, it's just wacky how how different things are uh, are out there, and I'm so happy to have done it. Everyone said before I went when I was pissed about going that they were like, "It's going to be a great experience." You, I heard that line over and over and over again. I was like, "Fuck you! I don't want to go. I don't care how good of an experience yeah. it's going to be." And then I get back and I'm like, "Yeah, it was a good experience. <laughs> it's, <fine. laughs> it's better than Brandon. It's better than Brandon." And Brandon naturally led me here because there's nothing to do in Brandon, and I lost my friend group out there in a pretty rough situation. So that was a good time to come out here and uh and start over and i'm glad i did because i got to meet pretty cool people and be on an awesome podcast like this yeah as good as it gets man. as good as it gets <laughs> yeah. living the good life now all right pretty happy about that but yeah if there's one thing to take away it's just like get get some critical thinking get some emotional thinking and like meet different kinds of people and realize that they're the same because and think different like your sweater think you different. can't really see it oh yeah oh it's uh through the stains there but yeah yeah all right. Well, thank you for coming on, Jeremy. Absolutely. It was a, a pleasure. I'm sure a lot of people will be disappointed. <laughs>